On April 12, 1864, the American Civil War took a turn when Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest captured Fort Pillow, Tennessee. This fort, perched on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River, held strategic importance for both sides. Its capture would disrupt the Union's control of the river. General Forrest, a man known for his audacious tactics, led his troops in a daring daylight assault. The fort's steep incline and formidable defenses, manned by a garrison of about 600 Union soldiers, were no match for Forrest's force of nearly 1,500 men. The Confederates stormed the fort, facing a resistance that was fierce yet futile. The Union soldiers fought valiantly, but they were outnumbered and outmaneuvered. The battle was as brutal as it was brief. Within hours, Forrest's men had seized control of Fort Pillow. The cost of this victory was high. The Union suffered heavy losses, with nearly half of their forces either killed or wounded. The Confederates, too, paid a steep price, with over a hundred men lost and nearly 300 wounded. What followed the capture was a controversial massacre, with reports of Confederate soldiers killing Union soldiers who had surrendered or were wounded. This event, known as the Fort Pillow Massacre, remains a contentious issue in the annals of American history. The capture of Fort Pillow had far-reaching implications. It dealt a significant blow to the Union's control of the Mississippi River, a vital supply route. More than that, it was a psychological victory for the Confederates, boosting their morale and reinforcing their belief in their cause. Strategically, it forced the Union to divert resources and troops to retake the fort, thus altering their war strategy. For the Confederates, it affirmed General Forrest's reputation as a formidable commander and bolstered their resolve to continue the fight. The capture of Fort Pillow not only proved a tactical victory for the Confederates, but also a moral blow to the Union, intensifying the war. Just a week later, on April 20th, the town of Plymouth, North Carolina fell into Confederate hands. The Confederate forces were led by none other than the renowned General Robert F. Hoke. Up against a Union garrison, the Confederates faced stiff resistance. The battle raged on for four long days, resulting in heavy casualties on both sides. But the Confederates, with their ironclad ram CSS Albemarle, proved too much for the Union forces. The town was captured, the Union garrison surrendered, and approximately 2,500 Union soldiers were taken as prisoners of war. This Confederate victory had significant implications for the war. It not only boosted the morale of the Confederate troops, but also disrupted the Union's plans in North Carolina. The successful capture of strategic points like Plymouth was instrumental in shaping the Confederate strategy, instilling a sense of hope and determination. The capture of Plymouth was another notch in the Confederate belt, further tilting the war in their favor. Two days later, a significant non-combat event took place. The motto, In God We Trust, was stamped on U.S. coins for the first time. This decision, made by then-Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase, was driven by the public demand to acknowledge God in a national way amidst the Civil War chaos. The sentiment was met with a wave of approval by a citizenry seeking solace and unity. This motto, still seen on U.S. currency today, was a testament to the faith held by many during these turbulent times. The very next day, April 23rd, marked a significant engagement at Cane River Crossing, Louisiana. This was a crucial part of the Red River Campaign where both Union and Confederate forces faced off in a tense standoff. On one side, we had the Union forces led by Admiral David Dixon Porter and General Nathaniel Banks, a man known for his strategic prowess and commanding presence. His troops were a force to be reckoned with, numbering approximately 12,000. Opposing them were the Confederate forces under the command of General Richard Taylor, son of the former U.S. President Zachary Taylor. His forces were smaller in comparison with around 5,000 men, but what they lacked in numbers, they made up for in determination and tactical acumen. The day was fraught with tension as both sides engaged in a fierce battle. The Union forces, although larger, found themselves facing a well-entrenched and determined Confederate defense. The day ended with the Union forces unable to break through the Confederate lines. The casualty toll was heavy on both sides. The Union forces suffered around 400 casualties, while the Confederates reported approximately 300. Each loss was a blow, a stark reminder of the human cost of this bloody conflict. The engagement at Cane River Crossing ended in a tactical stalemate, with neither side able to claim a decisive victory. However, it had a profound impact on the overall war. The inability of the Union to secure a clear victory further extended the campaign, draining resources and morale. The Confederates, on the other hand, 
were emboldened by their ability to hold off a larger force, which played a role in shaping their future strategies. The engagement at Cane River Crossing was a hard-fought battle, with significant losses on both sides, further deepening the scars of war. On April 25th, action ensued at Marks Mills in Arkansas as part of Steele's Camden expedition. This day saw a fierce battle between Union forces led by General Frederick Steele and the Confederates commanded by General James Fagan. Marks Mills was a strategic location, situated at a crossroads that was crucial for supply lines. Steele's strategy was to secure these crossroads and garner much-needed supplies for his beleaguered troops. However, Fagan had a different plan. He intended to intercept Steele's forces and cut off their supply lines. The Confederates ambushed the Union forces at dawn. The surprise attack left the Union soldiers in disarray, and despite their resistance, the Confederates overpowered them. The battle was brutal and short-lived, with the Confederates seizing control of Mark's mills by midday. The casualty count was high on both sides. The Union forces bore the brunt of the losses, with over a thousand men captured or killed. The Confederates also suffered significant losses, but their victory ensured control over the strategic crossroads at Mark's mills. The result of the battle had a profound impact on Steele's Camden expedition. His forces were left without essential supplies, forcing them to withdraw and abandon their campaign in southern Arkansas. This Confederate victory further strengthened their control over Arkansas and the surrounding territories. The action at Marks Mills was yet another bloody chapter in the Civil War, as the nation continued to be torn apart by conflict. Imagine this, it's April 26th, 1864, and the Union fleet is trapped by low water on the Red River near Alexandria, Louisiana. This is no ordinary predicament. The Union's mighty ships, once a symbol of strength and intimidation, are now marooned in shallow waters, their hulls scraping against the riverbed. The men, conditioned for combat, are left in a state of uncertainty, their morale sinking with their grounded vessels. Meanwhile, the Confederates, situated at a safe distance, Watch this spectacle unfold. A mixture of disbelief and opportunistic delight grips them. There are no casualties, but the psychological toll is considerable. This trapping of the Union fleet, a mere twist of nature, had far-reaching implications. The Confederates, boosted by this unexpected advantage, were emboldened in their resistance. The Union, on the other hand, had to reassess their strategies, their invincibility question. This event dramatically shifted the dynamics of the war, a testament to the unpredictability of conflict. Moving forward to April 28th, we find ourselves in Princeton, Arkansas, amidst intense skirmishes on Steele's Camden expedition. Union forces, under the command of General Frederick Steele, clashed with Confederate soldiers led by General Joseph O. Shelby. Each side was brimming with determination, Union forces numbering around 4,000 men and Confederate forces slightly less, with about 3,500 men. The skirmishes were fierce, and the air was thick with the acrid sting of gunpowder. Bullets whizzed through the air and the ground was littered with the fallen. The Union forces suffered heavy casualties losing nearly 500 men, while the Confederates lost around 300. Despite their losses, the Union forces emerged victorious, seizing control of Princeton. This victory, albeit costly, provided a much-needed morale boost for the Union forces and marked a significant turning point in the war. The results of these skirmishes were a significant turning point in the war. Fast forward to April 30th, we're at Jenkins Ferry, Arkansas, another key location on Steele's Camden expedition. The Union, commanded by General Frederick Steele, clashed with Confederate forces under General E. Kirby Smith. Thousands of men fought fiercely, leading to numerous casualties on both sides. Despite their efforts, the Union forces were forced to retreat, marking a significant victory for the Confederates. This encounter, though seemingly minor in the grand scheme, had a profound impact. The engagement at Jenkins Ferry added another layer to the complex narrative of the Civil War. Come May 5th, we're in Virginia witnessing the Battle of the Wilderness. This two-day conflict, a fierce testament of courage and strategy, leaves an indelible mark on the Civil War. On the second day, a blow is struck deep within the Confederate ranks as General James Longstreet is seriously wounded. With armies clashing and casualties mounting on both sides, the victor remains unclear. Yet the outcome of this battle plays a significant role in shaping the course of the war. The Battle of the Wilderness was a brutal testament to the ravages of war, forever marking the course of the Civil War. 
But picture this, it's May 7th, 1864. The air is thick with anticipation as General William T. Sherman embarks on his Atlanta campaign. This was no ordinary campaign, but a calculated strategic move that began in the rugged terrains of Tennessee. The goal? To cripple the Confederacy's capability to wage war by systematically dismantling their supply routes and infrastructure. Planning this campaign was akin to orchestrating a symphony, with Sherman fine-tuning each detail, each movement of his troops. Preparation was key, and the Union soldiers readied themselves for the arduous journey ahead. As the day dawned, the troops began their steady march, a sea of blue uniforms moving as one. But this was just the beginning of a series of events that would define the month of May in the year 1864. As the Union troops march onwards, another significant event unfolds on the same day. Simultaneously, Union troops are making a pivotal move, seizing Tunnel Hill. This strategic point, an essential tunnel on the Western and Atlantic Railroad, was a vital artery for the Confederate forces. The Union forces faced minimal resistance, and the seizure was swift, resulting in few casualties. This successful capture cut off a key supply route for the Confederacy, leaving them at a significant disadvantage. With Tunnel Hill now under Union control, the Atlanta campaign was off to a promising start. Fast forward to May 8, we find ourselves in the midst of the Battle of Spotsylvania, Virginia. The Union troops, led by the tenacious General Ulysses S. Grant, faced off against the Confederate forces under General Robert E. Lee. The face-off was fierce with a staggering 100,000 men on the Union side and approximately 50,000 from the Confederate side. The battle was a grueling 12-day affair that left both sides with heavy casualties. The Union lost approximately 18,000 men, while the Confederates suffered around 12,000 losses. Despite the heavy losses, it was not a clear victory for either side. The Battle of Spotsylvania, however, played a significant role in the overall war. It marked a turning point where the Union began to gain momentum, slowly but surely pushing back the Confederate forces. The battle showed that the Union was willing to fight, and fight hard, to preserve the nation. The Battle of Spotsylvania was a bloody affair but the action doesn't stop there. On the same day, another engagement is taking place at Doug Gap, Georgia. Commanders rally their troops, thousands strong, facing the grim reality of war. Casualties mount, the victor emerges, shaping the course of the conflict. The events at Doug Gap were yet another chapter in the unfolding saga of the Civil War. The sun rises on May 9th, and the Civil War rages on at Swift Creek, Virginia. Commanders muster their men, casualties mount, and the tide of battle shifts. This engagement, a crucial pivot, echoes through the annals of the war. And so, the war continued, shaping the course of American history forever. The sun rose on May 11, 1864, casting long shadows on the battlefield of Yellow Tavern, Virginia. Two formidable leaders, Union General Philip Sheridan and Confederate General Jeb Stuart, commanded their troops, 10,000 and 4,500 respectively. The clash took a heavy toll with 625 Union and 800 Confederate casualties. This battle ended in Union's favor, significantly dampening the spirits of the Confederate cavalry. The Battle of Yellow Tavern marked a strategic Union victory, crippling the Confederates' once dominant cavalry. A day later on May 12th, the Battle of Spotsylvania continued with a fierce fight for the Bloody Angle. The Bloody Angle was a pronounced bend in the Confederate defense line, a critical point that bore witness to some of the most savage warfare of the American Civil War. On this very day, the Confederacy suffered a significant loss. General Jeb Stuart, one of the South's finest cavalry commanders, succumbed to a wound he had received at the Battle of Yellow Tavern. Stuart was just 31, yet his daring tactics and audacious spirit had made him a cornerstone of the Confederate war effort. His death sent shockwaves through the Confederate ranks, casting a somber shadow over their morale. Stuart's loss was more than just a man. It was the loss of a symbol of Southern resilience, a beacon of hope in the face of overwhelming odds. Stuart's death was a blow to the Confederacy, a loss from which it never truly recovered. On May 13, the Battle of Resaca, Georgia began, marking another pivotal moment in the war. The Union forces, under the command of Major General William T. Sherman, outnumbered the Confederates nearly two to one, with over 110,000 Union soldiers compared to the Confederates' 64,000, led by General Joseph E. Johnston. The battle was fierce, 
with both sides suffering heavy casualties, 3,500 Union and 2,800 Confederate. Despite the losses, the Union emerged victorious. This victory played a key role in the Atlanta campaign, giving the Union a strategic advantage and pushing the Confederates further back into their own territory. The Battle of Resaca was a Union victory, further pushing the Confederates back into their own territory. Two days later, on May 15th, the Battle of Newmarket, Virginia, unfolded. Union Major General Franz Siegel and Confederate Major General John C. Breckinridge were the commanding officers, each leading their respective forces into a conflict that was both bloody and decisive. The Union marched with 6,275 men, while the Confederates countered with a slightly smaller force of 5,600. Casualties were high on both sides, with the Union losing 841 soldiers and the Confederates losing 577. Despite being outnumbered, the Confederates claimed victory, successfully deterring a potential Union threat to the Shenandoah Valley. The Battle of Newmarket was a rare Confederate victory in 1864, a glimmer of hope in a time of increasing desperation. On May 18, 1864, the tranquil bayous of Louisiana became a battlefield. The engagement at Yellow Bayou, also known as Bayou de Glaze, was a part of the larger Red River expedition. Commanding the Union was Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, at the helm of some 30,000 men. Opposing him was Major General Richard Taylor, leading about 18,000 Confederates. The Union saw around 200 casualties, the Confederates 50. A tactical stalemate, but a strategic Union victory, Yellow Bayou marked the end of the Red River Campaign, a Union initiative that had mixed success. Two days later, on May 20th, the Battle of Ware Bottom Church took place in Virginia. Major General Benjamin Butler led the Union troops, numbering around 10,000, while General P.G.T. Beauregard commanded the Confederate forces around 4,200 in strength. The battle saw the Union lose about 1,000 men, while the Confederates lost 600. Despite their smaller numbers, the Confederates emerged victorious, a significant win that helped prolong the Siege of Petersburg, a crucial aspect of the Confederate defense. On May 23rd, the Battle of North Anna River in Virginia unfolded. Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant led the Union with around 68,000 men, while General Robert E. Lee commanded the Confederates with a force of 53,000. The conflict was grueling, with the Union losing approximately 2,600 men and the Confederates around 1,800. The battle ended inconclusively, yet it marked a shift in the Overland Campaign, with both sides suffering heavy losses. On May 25th, the Battle of New Hope Church raged in Georgia. The Union, under the command of Major General William T. Sherman, boasted a strength of around 16,000 men. They faced the Confederates, led by General Joseph E. Johnston, who commanded an army of approximately 24,000. The battle was fierce, and the Union suffered heavy losses with about 1,600 men falling, compared to the Confederates' 450. Despite their numerical disadvantage, the Confederates managed to secure a victory. This triumph was more than just a win on the battlefield. It was a strategic check on Sherman's Atlanta campaign. The Confederates' victory at New Hope Church stalled Sherman's Atlanta campaign, a crucial Union offensive. Just two days later, on May 27, the Battle of Pickett's Mill took place in Georgia. At the helm of the Union forces was Major General Oliver O. Howard, commanding around 14,000 men. On the other side, leading the Confederate forces with a strength of 10,000 men, was General Patrick Cleburne. The day was brutal, with the Union forces suffering heavy losses. Around 1,600 men from the Union fell, while the Confederates lost about 500. Despite their numerical disadvantage, the Confederates managed to claim victory. This triumph at Pickett's Mill was more than just a single battle won. It was a demonstration of Confederate resilience, further delaying the Union's Atlanta campaign in the face of overwhelming odds. On May 28, 1864, a significant skirmish erupted near Jacksonville, Florida. The Union and Confederate forces, under the command of their respective leaders, clashed in a fierce confrontation. Both sides, each with a substantial number of men faced substantial casualties. The outcome of this skirmish, as with many in the Civil War, was far from trivial. The victor gained not just territory, but also a strategic advantage. This skirmish, although small in scale, played a significant role in the grand scheme of the Civil War. 
While Florida witnessed its own conflict, the Battle of Dallas was unfolding in Georgia. Two prominent figures led their troops fearlessly into the fray, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman and Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston. Each side boasted an impressive number of soldiers, with casualties mounting as the battle raged on. After days of relentless fighting, the Union emerged victorious. The Battle of Dallas, a brutal confrontation, left an indelible mark on the war's progression. A day later, on May 29, the Confederates executed a strategic capture of a wagon train at Salem, Arkansas. Union soldiers, unsuspecting and unprepared, fell into Confederate hands. Casualties were few, but the psychological blow was significant. The wagon train, laden with supplies, was a loss to the Union and a gain for the Confederacy. This event, while seemingly minor, disrupted Union supply lines, bolstering Confederate morale and turning the tide in the local conflict. The capture at Salem, seemingly minor, had far-reaching consequences in the theater of war. On the last day of May, a fierce combat took place at Bethesda Church, Virginia. The Union, led by General Ulysses S. Grant, squared off against the Confederate forces under the command of Robert E. Lee. Each side had around 40,000 men. The battle was brutal, resulting in heavy losses on both sides. Ultimately, the Confederates held their ground, causing the Union to retreat. This event further intensified the struggle, extending the war's timeline. The combat at Bethesda Church was a testament to the relentless nature of the Civil War. June 1 marked a major Union attack at Cold Harbor, Virginia. Under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant, the Union soldiers advanced, their numbers overwhelming. The Confederates, led by General Robert E. Lee, held their ground. Casualties were numerous on both sides, painting a grim picture of war. The Union, despite their aggressive assault, did not secure a victory. The Confederates managed to fend off the attack, altering the dynamics of the war. The Union attack at Cold Harbor was a turning point in the war, forever changing its course. Just two days later, on June 3, an all-out Union assault took place at the same location. Commanded by the same leaders, thousands of men courageously stormed the battlefield. The day was marked by staggering casualties on both sides, painting a grim picture of the war's reality. Despite the heavy losses, the Union emerged victorious. This all-out assault, a testament to the Union's determination, played a pivotal role in the Civil War's outcome. On the 5th of June, 1864, a significant battle unfolds at Piedmont, Virginia. Commanding the Union forces, Major General David Hunter faces off against Confederate General William E. Jones. Amidst the smoke and fury, tens of thousands of men clash, the air heavy with their determination and fear. As the dust settles, the toll is heavy on both sides. Yet the Union emerges victorious, their win at Piedmont dealing a substantial blow to Confederate forces. This victory sets the stage for further Union successes. A day later on June 6, another engagement ensues at Lake Chico, Arkansas. The Union, commanded by Colonel Powell Clayton, faces off against Confederate forces led by Colonel Archibald Dobbins. Each side, comprising around 500 men, fights fervently. The clash results in significant losses for both sides, but the Union emerges victorious. This engagement, though not a major battle, chips away at the Confederates' resolve, further tipping the scales in favor of the Union. The Union victory at Lake Chicot, while minor, played its part in weakening Confederate morale. Two days pass and on June 8th, a political milestone is reached. Abraham Lincoln, the man who'd become the face of the Union's cause, is nominated for a second term as U.S. President. This news reverberates through the ranks, fueling the Union's morale. But for the Confederates, his nomination only cements Lincoln's image as their staunch adversary. The public, consumed by the war, is split by this development. With Lincoln's nomination, the Union's resolve to end the war strengthened, while the Confederates saw their enemy fortified. On June 10th, another significant battle erupts at Bryce's Crossroads, Mississippi. Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest leads roughly 5,000 men against a Union force twice their size. Despite their numbers, the Union, under the command of General Samuel D. Sturgis, faces a crushing defeat. The Confederate victory comes at a cost, with significant casualties on both sides. The Confederate victory at Bryce's Crossroads provided a temporary morale boost for the South, but the war was far from over. The 11th of June sees two conflicts, a skirmish at Pine Mountain, Georgia, and a battle at Trevilian Station, Virginia. The skirmish at Pine Mountain is led by General William T. Sherman for the Union, and General Joseph E. Johnston for the Confederates. The Confederates, despite their smaller numbers, hold their ground and claim a strategic victory. Meanwhile, at Trevilian Station, 
the largest all-cavalry battle of the Civil War unfolds. Here, Union General Philip Sheridan clashes with Confederate General Wade Hampton. Despite heavy losses on both sides, the Union forces managed to disrupt Confederate supply lines, securing a tactical victory. The consequences of these two conflicts are significant. The Confederate success at Pine Mountain boosts Southern morale, while the Union victory at Trevilian Station disrupts crucial Confederate supply lines. The mixed results of June 11th, with a Confederate victory at Pine Mountain and a Union victory at Trevilian Station, kept the war's outcome in the balance. June 15, 1864. The air is heavy over Petersburg, Virginia. The Union Army, led by General Ulysses S. Grant, stages the first attack on the Confederate stronghold. Over 50,000 Union soldiers clash with roughly 20,000 Confederates. The day ends with thousands of casualties on both sides, yet no clear victor emerges. Petersburg's strategic location makes it a crucial point in the war, a gateway to the southern capital. The battle rages, but the Confederates under General P.G.T. Beauregard hold their ground. The war continues. Fast forward to June 19th, we're not in America anymore. We're near France where the USS Kearsarge, a Union ship, sinks the Confederate ship CSS Alabama. The two vessels were there due to the Alabama's campaign of commerce raiding. The confrontation, led by Captain John Winslow for the Union and Raphael Sims for the Confederacy, resulted in a dramatic Union victory. Though casualties were minimal, the sinking of the Alabama dealt a significant blow to the Confederates' naval power. The Alabama goes down, marking a notable victory for the Union at sea. Two days later on June 21st, turmoil stirs in the Confederate government. Christopher Memminger, the Confederate Secretary of the Treasury, resigns. Beset by inflation and a lack of resources, Memminger's position had become untenable. It's unclear if he stepped down voluntarily or was nudged out, but his departure certainly shook the Confederates' financial structure. His resignation, amid the war's chaos, was a severe blow to the Confederate government, further destabilizing their already precarious situation. His resignation leaves a void in the Confederate leadership, further weakening their position. June 22nd takes us to Georgia, to the Battle of Kolb's Farm, also known as Culp's Farm. Confederate General John Bell Hood, with around 10,000 men, faced off against Union General Joseph Hooker's force of about 15,000. The Union, seeking to seize this strategic location, suffered heavy losses with approximately 1,500 casualties to the Confederates' 350. Despite the Union's aggressive assault, the Confederates prevail, maintaining control of the strategic location. Five days later, still in Georgia, the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain unfolds. Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston squares off against Union General William Tecumseh Sherman. The Union forces, numbering around 100,000, attempt to dislodge the 35,000 entrenched Confederates. Despite their superior numbers, the Union suffers heavy losses, with almost 3,000 casualties compared to the Confederates' 800. The Confederates hold their ground, dealing a blow to the Union's advance. June 29th, back in Virginia. A skirmish at Ream Station on Wilson's Raid brings the month to a close. Union General James H. Wilson led a force of nearly 12,000 men against the Confederate troops under William T. Anderson. Despite their numbers, the Union suffers a defeat with heavy casualties over a thousand. This defeat was a blow to the Union's morale, a stark reminder of the Confederates' resilience. The month ends with a Union defeat, a harsh reality of the brutal war. July 9, 1864. A day etched in the annals of American history, the Battle of Monocracy unfolds in Maryland. Leading the Union was Lew Wallace, meeting Confederates Jubal early on the battlefield. Both sides, brimming with manpower, faced inevitable casualties. The clash was fierce, the toll heavy. Despite the Confederates' victory, the aftermath echoed across the war front. The Battle of Monocracy, a Confederates' victory, yet it delayed their march towards Washington. Three days later, on July 12th, Early's Confederate troops descended upon Fort Stevens, D.C. The purpose? to distract Union forces and potentially capture the capital. Resistance was fierce, and casualties were inevitable. However, the Confederates met with a solid wall of Union firepower and were forced to retreat. The immediate result was a failed raid, but the ripple effects were profound. This audacious attempt on the capital forced the Union to reconsider their defense strategies. The raids, a tactical move, yet it left a lasting imprint on the war's progression. July 14th, the battleground shifts to Tupelo, Mississippi. The Confederate forces, led by General Nathan Bedford Forrest, clash with the Union's General Andrew J. Smith. The Confederates, numbering around 8,000, 
face a Union army of nearly 20,000. The battle rages, leaving hundreds wounded or dead on both sides. Despite the Confederates' tenacity, the Union emerges victorious. The Battle of Tupelo, a Union victory, a pivotal turning point in the war. July 17th, a significant day, Confederate General J.B. Hood replaces J. Johnston as commander of the Army of Tennessee. The Southern leadership believed a more aggressive approach was needed, and thus, Hood was chosen. President Jefferson Davis, skeptical of Johnston's defensive strategy, made this decision. Johnston stepped down, making the transition voluntary. Hood's aggressive style would lead to significant battles, altering the Confederates' army tactics and influencing the war's progression. This change in command, a strategic move that would steer the course of the war. July 18th, the Battle of Cool Spring, Virginia unfolds. Two commanding officers take center stage in this grand spectacle of war. On the Union side, the Stoic General Horatio Wright and his formidable force of around 5,000 men. The Confederates, under the command of the relentless General Robert Rhodes, boast a similar number of soldiers. The battle is fierce, the air thick with tension and the acrid smoke of gunfire. By the day's end the Union suffers nearly 700 casualties while the Confederates count around 500 of their own. Despite the heavy losses the Confederates emerge victorious. Their triumph, however, is not without consequence. This victory further emboldens the Confederate forces, stoking their fighting spirit. Yet it also galvanizes the Union into action, prompting them to redouble their efforts. The Battle of Cool Spring, a day of victory for the Confederates. Yet it marked a significant shift in the war's momentum. As the sun rose on July 20th, 1864, Rutherford's farm in Virginia was a scene of anticipation. Union General George Crook, commanding a force of around 6,000 men, stood ready. His Confederate counterpart, General Stephen Dodson Ramsur, commanded a slightly smaller force. The day ended with the Union victorious, their casualties numbering around 200, while the Confederates suffered around 400 casualties. This was a win that bolstered Union morale. Simultaneously down in Georgia, the Battle of Peachtree Creek was unfolding. Confederate General John Bell Hood, commanding an estimated 20,000 men, clashed with Union General George Henry Thomas and his force of around 21,000 men. The battle ended in a Union victory, with casualties estimated at around 6,000 for the Confederates and around 2,000 for the Union. This battle marked the beginning of a series of Union victories in Georgia. Two days later, the Battle of Atlanta took place. Union General William Tecumseh Sherman, commanding over 34,000 men, battled Confederate General John Bell Hood and his 24,000 men. The Union won, with casualties estimated at around 3,600 for the Confederates and around 3,700 for the Union. This victory paved the way for the Union's march to the sea. July 24th saw the Second Battle of Kernstown in Virginia. Confederate General Jubal Anderson Early, commanding around 10,000 men, faced off against Union General George Crook, and his force of around 5,000 men. The Confederates won, with their casualties estimated at around 700, while the Union suffered around 1,200 casualties. This Confederate victory delayed Union plans in the Shenandoah Valley. Four days later, the Battle of Ezra Church in Georgia took place. Union General Oliver Otis Howard, commanding around 13,000 men, battled Confederate General John Bell Hood and his force of around 18,000 men. The Union won with casualties estimated at around 3,000 for the Confederates and around 637 for the Union. This victory further weakened the Confederate hold on Atlanta. On July 30th, the town of Chambersburg in Pennsylvania was captured and burned by Confederate forces led by General John McCausland. He met little resistance and no casualties were reported. This event shocked the North and fueled anti-Confederate sentiment. That same day, the Battle of the Crater at Petersburg, Virginia took place. Union General Ambrose Burnside, commanding an estimated 15,000 men, faced off against Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his force of around 16,000 men. The Confederates won, with casualties estimated at around 4,000 for the Union and around 1,400 for the Confederates. This victory prolonged the Siege of Petersburg. These events, each significant in its way, shaped the course and the outcome of the American Civil War. As we remember them, we honor the bravery and sacrifice of those who fought and those who fell. On the 2nd of August, 1864, a cavalry skirmish erupted in Hancock, Maryland. Major Generals Hunter and Early led Union and Confederates, 
Approximately 5,000 soldiers fought in chaos and carnage. The swift yet fierce conflict resulted in Union victory, with Confederates repelled. The skirmish, albeit small, played a significant role in the progression of the war. Two days later, on August 4th, military operations began around Brazos, Santiago, Texas. General Nathaniel P. Banks commanded the Union's Texas Expedition. The aim was control the region, cutting off Confederate supplies. Despite stiff resistance and losses on both sides, the Union achieved its aim. The victory came with a toll highlighting war's harshness. The operations around Brazo Santiago marked a strategic move in the war. On August 5th, the Battle of Mobile Bay, Alabama unfolded. The Union, led by Admiral David Farragut, met the Confederate forces under Admiral Franklin Buchanan. With about 18 vessels each, the forces were evenly matched. Despite the high cost of over 300 Union casualties, they won the battle. But this victory came with significant Confederate losses, around 250. This battle was a game-changer in the Civil War. On August 6th, the CSS Tallahassee departed Wilmington, North Carolina for a three-week cruise. This mission was orchestrated by the audacious commander John Taylor Wood. His aim was to disrupt Union shipping along the Atlantic coast and divert their resources. This voyage was anything but ordinary. Marked by successful raids and narrow escapes, it played a pivotal role in the Confederates' naval operations. The crews of the CSS Tallahassee held strategic importance in the Confederates' naval operations. A day later, on August 7th, an engagement took place at Moore Field, West Virginia. Union General George Crook led 2,000 troops against Confederate General John McCausland's similar force. A brutal clash ensued, causing massive casualties. Yet the Union forces triumphed, halting the Confederate advance. The engagement at Moore Field was a pivotal event in the course of the Civil War. On August 9th, the Confederates detonated a bomb on a ship at City Point, Virginia. Orchestrated by Secret Service agents, the audacious act targeted a Union ammunition barge. Its goal was to disrupt supply lines, causing a substantial explosion and numerous casualties. Despite the devastation, it inadvertently strengthened the Union's resolve. The bombing at City Point marked a new level of intensity in the war. Continuing our journey through the August 1864 events of the American Civil War begins with the engagement at Guard Hill, Virginia, on August 16th, a day marked by the clash of Union and Confederate forces led by General Wesley Merritt and General Richard Anderson, respectively. Thousands of soldiers took to the battlefield that day, with the Union Army outnumbering their southern counterparts. The battle was fierce, with each side suffering considerable casualties. Yet, it was the Union forces who emerged victorious, seizing control of the strategic location. This engagement was more than a mere battle. It represented a turning point in the war, shaping the tactics and spirit of the armies. The engagement at Guard Hill marked a significant moment in the war, affecting the strategies and morale of both sides. Following the Guard Hill engagement, we moved to the Battle of Globe Tavern, which took place from August 18th to 21st. Union General Governor K. Warren led the charge against Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard. Warren had about 20,000 men, while Beauregard commanded around 14,000. On the first day, the Union forces seized the Weldon Railroad, cutting off a crucial Confederate supply line. Despite their best efforts, the Confederates couldn't dislodge the Union soldiers. Each day brought more fierce fighting, with neither side giving an inch. The battle was bloody, with the Union suffering approximately 4,000 casualties while the Confederates suffered around 1,500. Despite the heavy losses, the Union emerged victorious, retaining control of the railroad. The Battle of Globe Tavern was a pivotal event, shaping the course of the war in the days that followed. The victory gave the Union a strategic advantage, disrupting Confederate supply lines and shifting the momentum in their favor. Away from Virginia, on August 20th, a significant cavalry combat unfolded at Lovejoy Station on the Macon and Western Railroad in Georgia. Commanding officers, bracing their troops, locked in a battle that saw countless men fall. Though the victor emerged, the bloodshed left an indelible mark on both sides. The reason for this attack? The railroads, vital arteries of the Confederacy's transportation and communication. The combat at Lovejoy Station was a strategic move targeting the Confederacy's transportation and communication lines. On August 21st, the focus shifts to Summit Point, West Virginia, where a skirmish unfolded. Commanding officers led their men into battle, with casualties suffered on both sides. The victor's triumph influenced the course of the Civil War. 
The skirmish at Summit Point was another piece in the complex puzzle of the war. By August 23rd, the Federals had seized Fort Morgan at the entrance to Mobile Bay, Alabama. This strategic stronghold, once a Confederate bulwark, had fallen after a grueling two-week siege. The Federals' victory here was pivotal, gaining them control over the Gulf Coast's prime waterway. Yet, the Confederates still maintained their grip on the majority of the surrounding territory. The fall of Fort Morgan was a significant loss for the Confederacy, altering the dynamics of the war. The dust was thick on August 25, 1864, in Virginia, at the Second Battle of Reams Station. Union General Winfield Scott Hancock and Confederate General A.P. Hill led their men into a tumultuous clash. Despite their tenacity, the Union forces, outnumbered and outmaneuvered, suffered heavy casualties. The Confederate victory, a significant blow to the Union morale, left the Northern forces reeling. With the Confederates standing victorious, the Union forces were left to lick their wounds and regroup. Fast forward to August 31st, the Battle of Jonesboro, Georgia unfolds. Commanding the Union forces, Major General William T. Sherman faces off against Confederate General William J. Hardy. The battlefield teams with men, the Union outnumbering the Confederates nearly two to one. As the dust settles, the Union emerges victorious, yet the victory comes at a cost, with thousands of casualties on both sides. On the same day, up north in Chicago, Union General George McClellan finds himself in the political spotlight, nominated for president by the Democratic Party. This new role strains his relationship with President Lincoln, who reacts with a stoic resolve, viewing it as another hurdle in his tumultuous presidency. The undercurrents of politics and war intermingle, each influencing the other in ways that would shape the course of history. While the Union celebrated a victory in Jonesboro, political tides were shifting back in Chicago. September 1st, a day of movement and change as Confederates evacuate Atlanta, Georgia. The Confederate forces, under the command of General John Bell Hood, had to make a difficult decision. After weeks of fierce fighting, dwindling supplies, and an encroaching Union army, they made the strategic decision to retreat, moving southward to Palmetto. The effect on Atlanta was immediate. Homes and businesses were abandoned, streets fell silent, and the local economy was severely impacted. The city, once bustling with life, was now a ghost town. A day later, on September 2nd, the Federal Army, led by General William T. Sherman, entered Atlanta. Their plan was clear, to use Atlanta as a base for further Southern campaigns, cutting off Confederate supply lines and crippling their ability to wage war. Atlanta, a prized jewel of the South, now rested in Union hands. Two days later on September 4th, tragedy strikes in Greenville, Tennessee. A Confederate beacon, General John Hunt Morgan, met his untimely demise. The culprit, Union cavalrymen, led by a determined Captain Tom Quirk, a fatal gunshot ended Morgan's life, a man known for his daring raids and audacious leadership. This was more than just a personal loss. With Morgan's fall, the Confederates lost a daring leader, marking another somber note in the war's progression. The date was September 7, 1864. Union General William T. Sherman had just ordered the evacuation of Atlanta. It was a decision born of strategic necessity, as the Union sought to cripple the Confederacy's logistical capabilities. Atlanta's citizens, their lives already upended by the war, were ordered to leave their destination, the yet unscathed southern and eastern cities. The city's strategic importance meant that it had to be emptied, its resources denied to the enemy. In the face of war, Atlanta's citizens were left with no choice but to abandon their homes. A day later, on September 8th, George McClellan accepted his nomination as the Democratic candidate for president. Once a Union general, McClellan had a complicated relationship with President Lincoln, who had previously relieved him of his command. McClellan's acceptance of the nomination stirred the political pot, sparking questions of Lincoln's reaction and potential retaliation. Despite the tension, McClellan remained uninvolved in active military duty. His nomination marked a significant turning point in the politics of the Civil War. Flash forward to September 16th. Confederate General Wade Hampton led a daring raid at Coggins Point, Virginia. This audacious maneuver aimed to seize Union livestock, a critical resource during the war. Despite the high stakes, casualties were surprisingly few, a testament to Hampton's strategic prowess. The victorious Confederates returned with over 2,000 head of cattle, a significant blow to the Union's logistics. The raid at Coggins Point demonstrated the desperate measures being taken in this brutal conflict. 
Three days later, on September 19th, the Battle of Third Winchester unfolded in Virginia. Union General Philip Sheridan led about 39,000 men against Confederate General Jubal Early's 12,000. The battle was fierce, resulting in approximately 5,000 casualties on the Union side and about 3,000 for the Confederates. Despite the heavy losses, the Union emerged victorious, pushing the Confederates back. This victory significantly weakened the Confederate forces in the Shenandoah Valley. The Battle of Third Winchester marked a crucial moment in the American Civil War. On September 22, the Battle of Fisher's Hill raged on in Virginia. Commanded by Union General Philip Sheridan and Confederate General Jubal Early, the forces clashed in a decisive confrontation. Sheridan's superior numbers proved overwhelming for Early's men, leading to a significant Union victory. The casualty toll was high, painting a grim picture of the war's human cost. This battle marked a turning point, as it opened the strategic Shenandoah Valley to Union control. The Battle of Fisher's Hill brought further devastation and strategic shifts in the war. Finally, on September 23, a skirmish broke out at Athens, Alabama. Commanded by Union Colonel Wallace Campbell and Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, both sides were fiercely prepared. The Union, with roughly a thousand men, clashed with the Confederate forces numbering around 3,000. The skirmish was brief, yet brutal, with casualties on both sides. Despite the Union's valiant defense, the Confederates emerged victorious, further escalating the tension of the Civil War. The skirmish at Athens, though lesser known, played its part in the grand scheme of the Civil War. A significant encounter unfolded on September 27, 1864, known as the Battle of Pilot Knob at Fort Davidson, Missouri. The commanding officers, Union Major General Thomas Ewing Jr. and Confederate Major General Sterling Price, faced off in a clash that would test the mettle of both sides. The strength of the armies was vastly unequal, with around 12,000 Confederates against a meager 1,500 Union soldiers. Despite these odds, the battle was far from one-sided. The Union side suffered around 200 casualties, while the Confederates, on the other hand, took a heavy blow with approximately 1,000 casualties. This disparity in losses was a testament to the Union's strategic prowess and tenacity. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the Union forces managed to repel the Confederate assault, effectively slowing their march into Missouri. This battle proved the resilience of the Union forces, even when outnumbered. Tragedy struck the same day at Centralia, Missouri. A gruesome event unfolded as Confederate guerrilla leader William T. Anderson, also known as Bloody Bill, and his men massacred around 24 unarmed Union soldiers. This shocking act of violence sent tremors of fear through the Union ranks and further inflamed the existing conflict. The chilling event, known as the Centralia Massacre, served as a grim reminder of the brutality of war and the lengths to which men would go in the pursuit of their cause. The Centralia Massacre, a grim reminder of the brutality of war. The following day on September 28th, a skirmish erupted at Decatur, Georgia. Union Brigadier General John W. Sprague and Confederate Major General Joseph Wheeler commanded their respective forces. Despite the small number of men involved, the engagement was fierce, albeit with a minimal casualty count. This skirmish was one of many that kept Union forces on their toes, maintaining a persistent pressure on the Confederacy. The skirmish at Decatur was a testament to the constant tension during these times. On September 29th, the Battle of Fort Harrison unfolded in Virginia. Union Major General Benjamin Butler and Confederate Brigadier General John Gregg led their men into a bloody conflict. The Union forces, despite suffering around 3,300 casualties, were relentless. Their Confederate counterparts, enduring around 2,500 losses, struggled to maintain their hold. The fort eventually fell into the Union's hands, a significant blow to the Confederate defenses. The capture of Fort Harrison signified a turning point in the Richmond-Petersburg campaign. The month of conflict ended with a skirmish at Carter's Station, Tennessee on September 30th. Commanding officers led their troops, each side with its own unique strategies. The number of men was comparable, with each side suffering its share of casualties. This was not a major battle but a small-scale conflict that kept both sides on their toes. It contributed to the overall tension of the war, reminding each side of the constant threat that loomed. And as September came to a close, so did another chapter in the American Civil War. Picture this, the morning of October 2, 1864, in the heart of Saltville, Virginia. Confederate General Alfred E. Jackson, commanding over 2,500 men, stands against Union forces led by Brigadier General Stephen G. Burbridge. 
The day ends with Confederate victory, but at a cost. 400 casualties compared to the Union's 350. This engagement, a bloody chess game of strategy and survival, echoes throughout the war. The Saltville engagement, a crucial moment etched in the annals of the Civil War. Fast forward to October 5th, in the rugged terrains of Alatoona Pass, Georgia. The Union, under the command of Brigadier General John M. Corse and Confederate forces, led by Major General Samuel G. French, clashed furiously. Amid the deafening roars of cannons and muskets, men fell. The Union lost about 700 men, the Confederates, a thousand. Despite the Union's fewer numbers, their fierce resolve held the pass. This victory bolstered Union morale and hindered Confederate progress. The Battle of Alatoona Pass, a testament to the unyielding spirit of the soldiers. Next stop, October 6th, at the strategically significant Brock's Gap, Virginia. This engagement was led by commanding officers General John C. Breckinridge for the Confederates and Union's General Philip Sheridan. With a roster of thousands on each side, the battlefield was set for a fierce contest. The clash resulted in heavy casualties, but it was the Confederates who emerged victorious. This victory, however, was a short respite in the face of Union's overwhelming strength. The cavalry engagement at Brock's Gap, a play of strategy and courage. Now, imagine the high seas, October 7th, Bahia, Brazil. The Confederate ship, CSS Florida, under Captain Morris, is there for repairs. Unexpectedly, the Union ship USS Wachusett, commanded by Napoleon Collins, captures her in a daring night raid. Despite being in neutral waters, Collins defies diplomatic protocol to seize the opportunity. There are no casualties, but the Florida's fate is sealed. She's towed to America, only to sink in an accident. The capture of CSS Florida by Wachusett, an unexpected twist in the theater of war. Back on land, October 7th, the Battle of Darbytown Road, Virginia. Commanding the Union forces, we see Major General Alfred Terry, with Major General Robert Ransom Jr. leading the Confederates. Each side armed with roughly 14,000 men. The clash was fierce, resulting in over 700 casualties. The Union emerged victorious, their win proving pivotal in regaining control of the Richmond area. This victory bolstered Union morale, lending momentum to their cause. The Battle of Darbytown Road, a grim dance of power and survival. Finally, we arrive at October 9th, the engagement at Toms Brook, Virginia. Commanded by General George Custer and General Thomas Rosser, both forces clashed with approximately 10,000 men combined. The day ended with nearly 500 casualties, the majority from the Confederate side. The Union's victory here did more than just boost morale. It disrupted the Confederates' plans and solidified the North's control over the Shenandoah Valley. The engagement at Tom's Brook, the final act of defiance in a week that changed the course of the Civil War. On the 12th of October, 1864, a great man drew his last breath in Washington, D.C. Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney, aged 87, left his mortal coil, casting a significant impact on the Supreme Court. His death not only changed the dynamics of the court, but also sent ripples through the ongoing Civil War. President Lincoln, upon hearing the news, was faced with the daunting task of nominating a successor in these tumultuous times. The loss of Chief Justice Taney, would echo throughout the nation, leaving a void in the Supreme Court and the war. A day after, on October 13th, a daring act unfolded near Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Confederate Colonel John S. Mosby, known for his bold tactics, orchestrated a train robbery. His motives were twofold, to disrupt Union supply lines and to seize precious resources. The audacious raid was executed with precision, leaving the Union forces in disarray, Despite the inherent risks, no lives were lost, and Mosby's men secured valuable supplies. Colonel Mosby's audacity would make him a figure of both fear and admiration. A few days later, on October 19th, a raid would shock the quiet town of St. Albans, Vermont. Orchestrated by Lt. Bennett H. Young, a Confederate loyalist, the raid aimed to destabilize the Union by causing chaos in its backyard. The raiders, though successful in their surprise attack, failed to incite the larger rebellion they had hoped for. This audacious act, however, did strain diplomatic relations between the United States and Canada, adding yet another layer of complexity to the war. St. Albans, once a peaceful town, would never forget the day of the raid. On the same day, far from the turmoil in St. Albans, a significant battle ensued at Cedar Creek, Virginia. Commanding the Union was Major General Philip Sheridan, while Lieutenant General Jubal Early led the Confederate forces. 
The battle saw around 30,000 men on both sides, with casualties amounting to nearly 9,000. The Union emerged victorious, striking a significant blow to the Confederacy's Shenandoah Valley campaigns. The Battle of Cedar Creek would be a turning point in the war. Three days later, on October 22nd, the war thundered on at Byram's Ford, Missouri. Major General Samuel R. Curtis led the Union forces, while Major General Sterling Price commanded the Confederates. Thousands of men clashed, their valor mirrored in the high casualty count. The Union claimed victory, tilting the scales of the war in their favor. This battle marked a turning point, as Confederate hopes in the West began to wane. The Battle of Byram's Ford was a testament to the relentless spirit of the soldiers. The next day, October 23rd, saw one of the largest battles of the war in Westport, Missouri. Commanded by Major General Samuel R. Curtis and Major General Sterling Price, the Union and Confederate forces clashed with approximately 30,000 men on each side. The intense fight resulted in heavy casualties, with the Union emerging victorious. This significant Union win proved pivotal, curtailing Confederate advances in the West. The Battle of Westport, a brutal clash of armies, would change the course of the war. In the heartland of America, on the 25th of October, 1864, a battle erupted in Kansas, a rare occurrence indeed. The Battle of Mine Creek, or Marais des Signes, as it was known, saw Union General Samuel R. Curtis and Confederate General Sterling Price at the helm. The Union forces, numbering around 2,500, faced off against a Confederate force nearly double their size. Despite being outnumbered, the Union emerged victorious, claiming the lives of over a thousand Confederate soldiers. This unexpected triumph in the heartland disrupted Confederate supply lines and morale, proving pivotal in the broader context of the Civil War. The Battle of Mine Creek, a significant clash in an unexpected place, shifted the tides of the Civil War. Two days later, on the 27th of October, the war moved east to Virginia, to the Battle of Boynton Plank Road. The Union, led by Major General Winfield S. Hancock, clashed with the Confederates under Lieutenant General A.P. Hill. The forces were sizable, with the Union fielding approximately 30,000 men, and the Confederates a slightly smaller but still formidable force of 20,000. The battle raged, leaving over 1,000 Union soldiers and approximately 600 Confederates as casualties. Despite their losses, the Union claimed a strategic victory, disrupting Confederate supply lines and gaining control of Boydton Plank Road. This battle was a significant turning point, shifting the momentum in favor of the Union. The Battle of Boyden Plank Road, a fierce contest with lasting implications. Still on the 27th of October, two engagements occurred in Virginia, at Fair Oaks and Darbytown Road. The Union, led by Major General Benjamin Butler, clashed with the Confederates under Lieutenant General Richard H. Anderson. With thousands of soldiers on both sides, the engagement saw a significant number of casualties. The Union emerged victorious tipping the scales in their favor. These back-to-back -back engagements, a testament to the intensity of the Civil War. Meanwhile, at Plymouth, North Carolina, the Union Navy made a significant move. They employed a torpedo, a relatively new weapon of war, to sink the Confederate ironclad Albemarle. This was a bold maneuver, demonstrating the Union's ingenuity and adaptability. The repercussions were felt immediately, with the loss of the Albemarle depriving the Confederates of a significant asset. Despite the audacity of the attack, casualties were minimal. This marked a turning point in naval warfare with technology playing an increasingly decisive role. The sinking of the Albemarle, a pivotal moment in naval warfare. Back on land, on the 30th of October, a skirmish broke out at Muscle Shoals, Alabama. The Union and Confederate forces led by their respective commanding officers clashed with an intensity that belied the relatively small number of soldiers on both sides. Despite the scarcity of troops, casualties were high, painting a grim picture of the war's toll. The Union emerged victorious, their win contributing to the shifting tides of the war. The skirmish at Muscle Shoals, a final clash in a month of relentless conflict. On the second day of November, 1864, an affair of great import unfolded at Hazen's farm near Duval's Bluff, Arkansas. This was no ordinary day, for it brought together key figures in a calculated play of strategy and power. The farm's strategic location, a stone's throw away from the river, made it a hot spot in the war's chessboard. The day's events, a complex weave of intrigue and confrontation, would leave an indelible mark on the war's trajectory. As the sun set over Hazen's farm, the echoes of the day's events lingered shaping the course of the war. Just two days later, on November 4th, a significant engagement took place at Johnsonville, Tennessee. 
Under the command of Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederates launched an attack on a Union supply base. The Union, under the command of Lieutenant Edward M. King, fought back valiantly. However, the day ended in Confederate victory, with heavy losses on both sides. This engagement was more than just a battle. It disrupted Union supply lines, shifting the momentum of the war. The engagement at Johnsonville marked a turning point, leaving its mark on the landscape of the war. On November 8th, a momentous event transpired. Abraham Lincoln was re-elected as the President of the United States. The North erupted in cheers, while the South met the news with a grim foreboding. Union soldiers celebrated, seeing it as a victory for their cause, while Confederate armies braced themselves for a prolonged fight. George McClellan, Lincoln's opponent, swallowed his disappointment, congratulating Lincoln on his victory. Lincoln's re-election was not just a political victory, it was a beacon of hope amidst the chaos of war. The 11th of November brought with it the Battle of Bulls Gap, Tennessee. Confederate General John C. Vaughn led his men against the Union forces under General Alvin C. Gillum. Despite their courage, the Confederates were outnumbered, leading to a high number of casualties. The Union victory proved pivotal, further weakening Confederate hold in East Tennessee. The Battle of Bulls Gap, a bloody chapter in the annals of the Civil War, left its indelible mark. On November 15th, William T. Sherman embarked from Atlanta on his infamous March to the Sea. The march aimed to cripple the Confederacy's ability to wage war by targeting infrastructure and civilian property. Sherman's 60,000 soldiers left Atlanta a smoldering wreck, an image of desolation that would haunt the South for decades. This march wasn't just a military operation, it was a psychological warfare designed to break the Confederate spirit. Sherman's march, a strategic masterstroke, left Atlanta in ruins and changed the course of the war. In the latter part of November, a skirmish unfolded at Columbia, Tennessee. Commanded by the determined General John Bell Hood and the steadfast Major General John Schofield, this clash saw thousands of brave men locked in a struggle for victory. The fighting was fierce and casualties were substantial on both sides. Yet, it was the Union forces that emerged victorious, further tilting the scales of the war. The skirmish at Columbia was a testament to the grit and resilience of the combatants, etching its story into the fabric of the Civil War. Picture this, November 25, 1864. A group of Confederate operatives led by Robert Cobb Kennedy plot a daring act of sabotage. The American Civil War was raging, and the Confederates were looking for a way to divert Union forces away from the main war front. Their plan? A series of fires set to erupt simultaneously across New York City targeting several prominent hotels and the popular Barnum's Museum. The goal was to create chaos, forcing the Union to divert their resources and attention. The man at the helm of this audacious plot was Robert Cobb Kennedy. A former Confederate soldier, Kennedy was no stranger to daring acts. Still, this was a gambit of a different sort. It was a plot designed not for the battlefield but for the heart of one of the Union's most bustling cities. The operatives infiltrated the city, armed with combustible Greek fire, a substance that could ignite and cause serious damage. The plan was to set the fires and escape before anyone realized what was happening. It was a plot that, if successful, would have changed the course of the war. But fate, it seemed, had other plans. As the operatives moved to execute their plan, they found their matches damp, unable to ignite the Greek fire. As they fumbled, the city's officials were alerted, and swift action was taken. The operatives were rounded up, and the fires that had been started were quickly extinguished. The plot had failed. There were no casualties, no grand diversion. But the event was not without consequence. It led to an increased wariness among Northerners, a heightened sense of security. The threat of sabotage was very real, and the war felt closer to home than ever before. Their plan, bold as it was, foundered, and New York City remained untouched. Yet, this failed fire plot of New York City serves as a stark reminder of the lengths to which people will go in times of war, and the resilience of a city under threat. Three days later, on November 28, Confederate General Thomas L. Rosser launched a daring raid on New Creek, West Virginia. With the Civil War raging, every move on the chessboard of conflict bore significant weight. For Rosser and the Confederates, New Creek represented more than a geographical location. It was a lifeline to Union forces a vital supply line that the South was desperate to disrupt. Rosser, an audacious leader known for his tactical flair, saw an opportunity in New Creek. 
The town was a hub of Union activity, bristling with supplies that the Confederates needed for their war effort. The plan was daring, but the stakes were high. If successful, the raid would not only disrupt Union supply lines, but would also provide the South with resources critical for their survival. As the Confederate forces rode into New Creek under the cover of darkness, they faced stiff resistance from a large Union garrison stationed there. The battle was fierce, with both sides losing men to the violence of war. Although the exact casualty figures remain unclear, what is certain is the courage displayed by both Confederate and Union soldiers in the face of adversity. Despite the Union's best efforts, Rosser's men prevailed. They captured the garrison and seized much-needed supplies, including ammunition, horses and food. The raid was a success, a rare victory for the Confederates during a time when such triumphs were few and far between. Rosser's raid on New Creek did more than disrupt Union supply lines and capture resources. It provided a morale boost for the Confederate forces, reminding them that even in the face of overwhelming odds, victory was possible. It was a spark of hope in the heart of the South, a beacon that lit the path during the darkest days of the Civil War. Rosser's raid was a rare victory for the Confederates during this time, providing much-needed supplies and a morale boost for the Southern forces. The very next day, November 29th, a horrific event unfolded in the Colorado Territory. This was a day that would be etched in the annals of American history as one of its darkest moments. Colonel John Milton Chivington, a former Methodist minister turned military man, led a contingent of Union soldiers and Colorado volunteers to Sand Creek. Their target? Peaceful encampments of Cheyenne and Arapaho people. Their motive? A cocktail of racial hatred and a relentless push to clear the way for white settlers. This was a day when the sanctity of human life was brutally ignored, and innocent lives were lost in a horrifying massacre. While the Civil War raged in the East, the struggles in the West were equally brutal. But rather than a clash of armies, it was a clash of cultures, a struggle for land and existence. Chivington and his men weren't just fighting a war, they were fighting a race. The Sand Creek Massacre, as it came to be known, saw the slaughter of hundreds of Native Americans. The victims were largely women and children, their lives extinguished in waves of unprovoked violence. The soldiers showed no mercy, no honor. They attacked at dawn, catching the villages by surprise. The peaceful inhabitants had little time to react, let alone defend themselves. The aftermath was a scene of utter devastation. The once vibrant encampments lay in ruins, their inhabitants massacred. The soldiers left as suddenly as they arrived, leaving behind a chilling silence that echoed the brutality of their actions. The repercussions of the Sand Creek Massacre were felt far and wide. It sparked outrage among some in the East, leading to congressional investigations and a national scandal. Yet, for the Native American tribes, it was a painful reminder of the cost of their existence in a land they once roamed freely. The Sand Creek Massacre remains one of the most infamous events of the Civil War a stark reminder of the brutal violence that extended beyond the battlefield. This was a day when the shadows of war stretched far beyond the lines of combat, casting a long, dark shadow on the American frontier. Back on the main war front, November 29th also saw the Battle of Spring Hill in Tennessee. This was a pivotal moment in the American Civil War, a chess match of strategies, where the Union and Confederate forces clashed with fervor. The Confederate side, led by Lieutenant General John Bell Hood, boasted around 23,000 men. On the other hand, the Union side, commanded by Major General John M. Schofield, held a force of approximately 10,000 men. The Battle of Spring Hill was a missed opportunity for the Confederate forces. Despite outnumbering the Union, the Confederates failed to cut off their retreat at Spring Hill. This oversight allowed Schofield's forces to slip away in the night, leading to a significant strategic failure for Hood and his men. Casualties were substantial on both sides. The Confederates suffered roughly 500 casualties, while the Union forces had around 350 casualties. The Battle of Spring Hill, though not a decisive victory for either side, was a pivotal moment that set the stage for the Battle of Franklin. The very next day, November 30th, the Battle of Franklin ensued. Hood, determined to make up for the lost opportunity at Spring Hill, attacked Schofield's forces head on. This time, the Union forces were ready. They dug into defensive positions, turning Franklin into a fortress. Commanding the Union forces was again Major General John M. Schofield, with approximately 28,000 men. Hood still commanded the Confederate forces, 
his numbers slightly reduced to around 27,000 men, after the previous day's battle. The Battle of Franklin was one of the bloodiest battles of the entire war. The Confederate forces suffered a staggering loss of about 6,300 men, while the Union forces lost roughly 2,300 men. Despite the high casualty rate, the Confederates failed to break the Union lines, resulting in a tactical victory for the Union. These two battles, Spring Hill and Franklin, had profound effects on the Civil War. They marked the beginning of the end for the Confederate Army of Tennessee, which never fully recovered from these losses. The Union's successful defense at Franklin, followed by their victory at Nashville, ensured their control over Middle Tennessee. The battles of Spring Hill and Franklin were bloody affairs, with heavy casualties on both sides, further deepening the scars of the Civil War. These battles, like many others during the war, highlighted the bravery, sacrifice, and the harsh realities of a nation divided. Also on November 30th, there was an engagement at Honey Hill, South Carolina. This clash, part of the wider Charleston campaign, was a pivotal moment during the American Civil War. Commanding the Union forces was Brigadier General John P. Hatch, a veteran officer with a reputation for tenacity. Hatch had under his command a force of roughly 5,000 men, a diverse mix of soldiers comprising both white and African-American regiments. Across the battlefield, the Confederates were led by Major General Gustavus W. Smith, an experienced tactician, commanding a smaller force of around 1,400 men. The battle's objective for the Union was to cut the Charleston and Savannah Railroad, a vital Confederate supply line. For the Confederates, the stakes were clear, defend the railroad at all costs. As the day unfolded, the Union forces found themselves at a disadvantage. The Confederate troops had established a formidable defensive position on a rise known as Honey Hill. The Union forces launched several assaults, but the Confederate position, coupled with their effective use of artillery, proved too robust. Casualties mounted on both sides, but the Union forces bore the brunt of the losses. By the end of the day, the Union had suffered over 700 casualties, including killed, wounded, and missing. The Confederates, on the other hand, lost fewer than a hundred men. Despite their valiant efforts, the Union forces were unable to achieve their objective. The Confederates successfully defended the railroad, maintaining a critical lifeline for their forces in the region. The engagement at Honey Hill had significant implications for the overall war. It stalled Union advances in the region, giving the Confederates precious time to regroup and reinforce. Yet it also highlighted the bravery and determination of the Union forces, particularly the African-American soldiers who fought gallantly in the face of adversity. The engagement at Honey Hill, like many other conflicts during this time, was a hard-fought battle with heavy losses on both sides. On the 1st of December, 1864, Union General John Schofield made a strategic move. Following the bitter defeats of the prior two days, he commanded his army to evacuate Franklin, Tennessee. The decision, though seemingly a retreat, was far from an admission of defeat. Schofield's forces withdrew to Nashville, setting the stage for what would become the pivotal Battle of Nashville. This retreat, although seen as a setback, was a calculated move that would heavily influence the course of the war. By the 4th of December, a significant engagement took place at Waynesboro, Georgia. The Union's General Kilpatrick led a force of 5,000 men against Confederate General Wheeler's 3,000. The battle was fierce, resulting in hundreds of casualties on both sides. Yet it was the Union who emerged victorious, capturing the town and disrupting Southern supply lines. This strategic triumph gave the Union a significant advantage, shifting the momentum of the war. The Waynesboro engagement, brutal as it was, played a pivotal role in the larger context of the war. Just two days later, on December 6th, Salmon P. Chase was named the Chief Justice of the United States. Chase was no stranger to politics. He was an ardent abolitionist, a former senator, and Lincoln's Treasury Secretary. His leanings were undeniably towards the North, a fact that was clear in his rulings. Chase's appointment was more than just a change in the judiciary. It was a move that had far-reaching implications for the war. By the 10th of December, the Federal Army had arrived in front of Savannah, Georgia. Their arrival was not one of surprise, but of strategy. The Federal Army's objective was clear, to encircle and besiege the city, cutting off all escape routes for the Confederates. The Confederate Army, now feeling the imminent threat, reacted with a mix of fear and defiance, their resilience tested. The Federal Army's arrival was a significant moment, one that reverberated through the ranks of the Confederate Army. 
Three days later, on December 13, Fort McAllister in Georgia was stormed. The Union forces, under the command of General William T. Sherman, sought to seize this Confederate stronghold. The ferocious attack resulted in the fort's capture, despite brave resistance. Sadly, this clash wasn't without loss as many soldiers on both sides fell. The Union's triumph didn't just mean the fall of a fort, but a significant blow to Confederate defenses. The storming of Fort McAllister was a decisive event, altering not just the fort's future but the course of the conflict. On the 15th and 16th of December Nashville, Tennessee became the stage for a monumental battle. Union General George Thomas led 55,000 men against Confederate General John Bell Hood's 30,000. The fierce conflict resulted in heavy losses, with the Confederates suffering 6,000 casualties, compared to 3,000 for the Union. The Union's victory marked a significant turning point, further weakening the Confederacy. The Battle of Nashville was a turning point, a clash that would echo through history long after the smoke had cleared. Picture this, it's December 17, 1864, we're near Franklin, Tennessee, the air is still, tense with the aftermath of a battle fought just days before, yet the soldiers, both Union and Confederate, are gearing up for another action. The reason, control, dominance, and the strategic importance of Franklin. The Union, fresh from their recent victory, is determined to consolidate their gains. The Confederates, on the other hand, are desperate to reclaim the lost ground. This action near Franklin was a crucial moment in the war, setting the stage for what was to come. Fast forward two days later, December 19th, we find ourselves at Rutherford Creek, Tennessee. The Union under Colonel Sidney Gilbert and the Confederates led by General John Bell Hood clashed in a fierce skirmish. With a thousand men each, the fight was intense, leaving dozens wounded or dead. The Union emerged victorious, but the cost was high. This confrontation, though small in scale, had a profound impact on the trajectory of the war. The skirmish at Rutherford Creek proved to be a turning point in the war, shifting the balance of power. The next day, December 20th, a pivotal event unfolds in Savannah, Georgia. The Confederates, under General William J. Hardy, made the difficult decision to evacuate the city. This decision came as a result of the Union's relentless pressure and the city's strategic importance. Amid the chill of winter, the Confederates slipped away, leaving Savannah to the Union. This wasn't just an evacuation, it was a turning point. The evacuation of Savannah marked a retreat for the Confederates, signaling a critical juncture in the conflict. December 24th, Christmas Eve, North Carolina's Fort Fisher becomes the center of attention. Union forces led by Major General Benjamin Butler launch an assault against the Confederate stronghold, defended by Colonel William Lamb. Both sides clash with a force of roughly 6,500 men each. The battle is fierce, but the Union cannot secure victory, suffering heavy casualties. The following day, Christmas, the Federals make a controversial decision, abandoning the attack. The reasons are manifold, including poor weather conditions and strong Confederate defenses. The impact is substantial, affecting the war's trajectory. The Confederates gain a morale boost, while the Union spirit is dampened. The attack and subsequent abandonment at Fort Fisher were key events, impacting the momentum and morale of both sides. Four days later, on December 28th, we find ourselves in Egypt, Missouri. Here, a pivotal engagement unfolded between the Union's forces led by Major General Andrew Jackson Smith and the Confederate troops under the command of General John Bullock Clark Jr. Both sides were evenly matched in numbers, with thousands of men locked in a fierce struggle. The losses were significant, with hundreds of casualties reported on both sides. Yet, it was the Union's strategic prowess that tipped the scales in their favor, resulting in a hard-fought victory. This engagement not only bolstered the Union's foothold in Missouri, but also dealt a significant blow to the Confederates' morale. The engagement at Egypt was the final event of this tumultuous month, leaving a lasting imprint on the course of the American Civil War. Picture a chilly day on January 12, 1865. A man named Francis Preston Blair Sr. ventures on a mission to negotiate peace. The American Civil War was in its fourth year, and the nation craved an end to the bloodshed. President Abraham Lincoln, seeking to bring about a peaceful resolution, dispatched Blair Sr., a seasoned politician and peace advocate, to engage in talks with Jefferson Davis, the President of the Confederate States. The air was thick with tension as Blair Sr. presented his proposition to Davis. The desperation for peace was palpable, yet the deep-seated differences between the two sides remained a formidable barrier. 
Davis, a staunch defender of the Confederate cause, rejected the peace terms asserting that they infringed upon the rights and autonomy of the South. Despite Blair Sr.'s best efforts, the peace he sought remained elusive, and the war raged on. The failed negotiation marked another grim milestone in a war that was far from over. Just a day after, on January 13, the second attack on Fort Fisher in North Carolina begins. The Union forces, led by Major General Alfred Terry, launch a relentless assault on the Confederate stronghold. They number over 8,000 against a defending force of less than 2,000 men under the command of Colonel William Lamb and General Braxton Bragg. Over these three grueling days of combat, both sides suffer heavy casualties. The Union forces, however, are relentless. On January 15th, they storm the fort, overpowering the Confederates and seizing control. The strategic importance of Fort Fisher cannot be overstated. Its capture cuts off the Confederacy's last major seaport, closing a critical supply line. This victory strikes a major blow to the Confederate cause, further tipping the scales in favor of the Union. The fall of Fort Fisher marked a significant turning point in the war, as the Confederacy lost control of one of its last major seaports. Fast forward to January 23rd, where we find General Joseph E. Johnston opposing Sherman's march through the Carolinas. Johnston, a seasoned soldier, utilized a blend of tactical retreats and guerrilla warfare, determined to slow Sherman's progress. Notable engagements included the Battle of Bentonville, a desperate attempt to halt the Union advance. Johnston faced a formidable challenge combating not only Sherman's superior forces but also the dwindling morale of his own troops. Despite Johnston's staunch opposition, Sherman's march continued, leaving a trail of destruction in its path. Eight days later, on January 31st, a monumental event shook the nation as the U.S. House passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. The public's response was a mixture of joy and apprehension. The Union Army celebrated, viewing it as a moral victory, while the Confederate Army met it with defiance. Jefferson Davis, too, reacted with staunch opposition. Yet, the significance of this event was enormous, marking a turning point not only in the war but also in the nation's history. And so, even amidst the chaos of war, a beacon of hope shone brightly as the chains of slavery were shattered forever. On the first day of February 1865, General Sherman and his troops were carving a path of destruction through the Carolinas. This scorched earth policy, known as Sherman's March, was designed to cripple the Confederacy's ability to wage war. The strategy was simple, destroy everything. From railroads to crops, Sherman's men left nothing untouched. This relentless onslaught not only depleted the Confederacy's resources but also shattered their morale. Sherman's march was a lethal blow to the Confederacy, undermining its strength and will to fight. Two days later, on February 3rd, Union and Confederate officials convened for a crucial meeting. This momentous gathering, known as the Hampton Roads Conference, took place aboard the steamboat River Queen in Hampton Roads, Virginia. The attendees were distinguished figures of their time. President Abraham Lincoln, and Secretary of State William H. Seward represented the Union, while Vice President Alexander H. Stevens, Senator Robert M. T. Hunter, and Assistant Secretary of War John A. Campbell stood for the Confederacy. Their agenda? To find a way to end the Civil War that had torn the nation apart. Despite their earnest deliberations, the discussions reached a stalemate. Lincoln insisted on the Union's reunification and the abolition of slavery, terms the Confederate officials couldn't accept. The outcome? The war raged on. The Hampton Roads Conference, while a significant attempt at peace, failed to halt the destructive conflict. Despite the conference, peace remained elusive and the war continued. February 5th brought a significant clash at Hatcher's Run, also known as Armstrong's Mill, in Virginia. The Union, under the command of Major General Governor K. Warren, and the Confederacy, led by Major General John B. Gordon, found themselves locked in a fierce confrontation. The Union forces, numbering around 28,000, were significantly larger than the Confederates' 9,000 men. The battle was brutal, with the winter weather making conditions even more challenging. The Union forces attempted to cut off the Confederate supply line, but were met with fierce resistance. Despite outnumbering their opponents, the Union forces were unable to achieve an outright victory. Casualties were high on both sides, the Union lost around 1,000 men while the Confederacy, with their smaller force, suffered around 800 casualties. Despite the lack of a clear victory, the Union's pressure on the Confederate supply line did have an impact. 
making an already difficult situation even harder for the Confederacy. The Battle of Hatcher's Run proved a costly affair, further straining the already stretched Confederate resources. On February 6th, a significant change in the Confederate leadership took place. John C. Breckinridge, a former Vice President of the United States, was appointed as the Confederate Secretary of War. This move was orchestrated by President Jefferson Davis himself, seeking a fresh approach to their military strategy. The Confederacy welcomed this change, hoping for a new direction amidst the turmoil. This appointment, however, was more than just a reshuffling of cards. Breckinridge's appointment marked a desperate attempt to turn the tide of the war. February 17th was a day of fire and flight in South Carolina. Union General William Tecumseh Sherman's forces set Columbia ablaze, a stark symbol of the Union's relentless march. This wasn't an act of wanton destruction but a calculated military strategy, aimed at demoralizing the Confederacy and hastening the war's end. Meanwhile, Confederate forces evacuated Charleston, leaving behind a city poised for Union capture. The burning of Columbia and the evacuation of Charleston further signaled the Confederacy's crumbling defenses. On February 22, the port city of Wilmington, North Carolina, fell into Union hands. This was the Confederacy's last open seaport on the Atlantic coast, and its capture was orchestrated by Union General John M. Schofield. The city's fall effectively closed off an essential supply line for the Confederacy, choking their ability to continue the fight. The impact was monumental. The loss of Wilmington was another devastating blow to the Confederacy, sealing their fate in the war. On a chilly day of March 2, 1865, the town of Waynesboro, Virginia, held its breath as the Union and Confederate armies stood face to face. Commanded by General Philip Sheridan and General Jubal Early respectively, each side was determined to dominate. The Union's superior numbers, however, led to a decisive victory, despite the fierce resistance. Casualties were heavy, a grim reminder of the cost of war. The dust settled over Waynesboro, lives were lost, but the war was far from over. Two days later on March 4, Abraham Lincoln stood tall, taking the oath for the second term as president. A wave of varied emotions swept the nation. In the North, people rejoiced, their faith in their leader renewed. The South, on the other hand, met the news with mixed feelings of apprehension and defiance. Key commanders like Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee each held their own perceptions, their reactions as diverse as the nation they represented. As Lincoln addressed the nation, the war continued to rage on. March 6, 1865, dawned with the sounds of gunfire in Florida at the Battle of Natural Bridge. Brigadier General William Miller led the Confederate forces, while Colonel John Newton commanded the Union troops. A fierce struggle ensued, with both sides suffering losses. The Confederates, with fewer men, stood their ground, ultimately driving back the Union forces. This victory, though small, bolstered Confederate morale in a time of dwindling hope. The Battle of Natural Bridge was over, but the echoes of the conflict continued to reverberate. In the midst of turmoil, on the same day, Lincoln made a strategic move, appointing Hugh McCulloch as the United States Secretary of the Treasury. McCulloch, a seasoned banker with a knack for fiscal policy, was Lincoln's choice to stabilize a war-ridden economy. McCulloch's appointment, the chessboard of war, saw another significant move. March 7 marked the beginning of a grueling four-day battle at Kingston, North Carolina. Union General Jacob Cox faced Confederate General Braxton Bragg, each commanding roughly 20,000 men. As the battle raged day by day, both sides suffered heavy casualties. Despite the Confederates' fierce resistance, the Union forces emerged victorious, significantly weakening the Confederates' hold on the Carolinas. As the sun set on March 10, the Battle of Kingston finally came to an end. The very same day, another engagement shook Monroe's Crossroads, South Carolina. Commanding the Union forces was General William T. Sherman, while on the Confederate side stood General Wade Hampton. Each side boasted a strong force, but the battle bore heavy losses. The victor? The Confederates claimed this one, but it was a hollow win in the grand scheme. With the engagement at Monroe's Crossroads, March of 1865 ended, leaving behind a trail of blood and battle cries. On a fateful day, March 13, 1865, Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, inked a law permitting black men to serve in the Confederate army. This bold move was driven by a desperate need for manpower. Yet, the late enactment and societal resistance meant few black men enlisted. Confederate commanders, their opinions divided, 
feared disturbing the social order. The controversial law, while a desperate measure, marked a significant shift in the Confederate stance on slavery. Three days later, on March 16th, the cannons roared in North Carolina, marking the beginning of the Battle of Averisboro. Commanded by General Hardy for the Confederates and General Slocum for the Union, the forces clashed fiercely. Despite being outnumbered, the Confederates held their ground, causing significant Union casualties. This tactical victory allowed the Confederate forces time to retreat, delaying the Union's advance. The Battle of Avrasboro, though a minor skirmish, held major implications for the war's final days. Two days after the dust settled in Avrasboro, the Confederate Congress adjourned on March 18th. This act was more than a simple procedural move. It was a symbolic acknowledgement of the impending defeat. The faith in victory had dwindled, and the reality of Union forces closing in became too stark to ignore. The Confederate government was collapsing, and the adjournment was a reflection of the desperate conditions. The adjournment of the Confederate Congress marked the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. The following day, on March 19th, the war raged on in North Carolina at the Battle of Bentonville. Commanded by General Joseph Johnston and Major General William Tecumseh Sherman, the Confederacy and Union clashed with around 60,000 and 20,000 troops respectively. Even though the Confederacy fought fiercely, they failed to halt the Union's advance, resulting in a heavy loss of over 4,000 troops. This battle marked the last major Confederate offensive, symbolizing the impending end of the war. The Battle of Bentonville signaled the final desperate attempts of a dwindling Confederacy. A few days later, on March 22nd, Union forces led by General James H. Wilson launched a daring raid on Selma, Alabama. The objective? To dismantle the South's arsenal and obstruct their war capabilities. Despite facing fierce resistance, Wilson's men prevailed, securing vital war materials. The price was high, with many brave soldiers paying the ultimate sacrifice. Yet the strategic importance of this raid was undeniable, shaking the Confederacy's foundation. Wilson's raid on Selma was a significant Union victory, further destabilizing the Confederates' war efforts. On March 25th, the war thundered on at Fort Stedman, Virginia. The Confederates, commanded by General John B. Gordon, launched a desperate assault against Union forces led by General John Park. Despite outnumbering the Union, the Confederates suffered heavy losses. The Union's victory wasn't just another battle won. It was strategic, weakening the Confederates' Petersburg line. This pivotal confrontation hastened the Union's final push, bringing the war closer to its inevitable end. The battle at Fort Stedman ended in Union victory, marking another nail in the Confederacy's coffin. In the heart of a tumultuous war on March 27, 1865, the siege of Spanish Fort in Alabama unfolds. Union General Edward Canby, a man of strategy and determination, orchestrates a plan to isolate Mobile, Alabama, the last major seaport of the Confederacy. On the opposing side, Confederate resistance is led by the stalwart Brigadier General Randall Gibson, ready to defend his post. The following 13 days bear witness to a fierce and unyielding siege. Each day is marked by the thunderous roar of cannons, the whizzing of bullets, and the grim toll of casualties on both sides. Yet the Confederate resistance could not withstand the relentless Union forces. The fort, once a symbol of Southern pride, falls into Union hands. This hard-won victory is more than just a conquest, it's a strategic triumph, a stepping stone to capturing Mobile, a Confederate stronghold. The Union victory at the Spanish Fort was a stepping stone to the capture of Mobile, a Confederate stronghold. Meanwhile, on the same day, President Lincoln met with Generals Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman at City Point, Virginia. This wasn't a casual gathering, but a strategic conference that would shape the course of the war. The agenda was clear to devise a plan of action that would bring an end to the bloody conflict that had torn the nation asunder for four long years. General Grant, the Union's top military commander, shared his strategy for an aggressive campaign against the Confederate capital Richmond. General Sherman, fresh from his devastating march to the sea, proposed to march north through the Carolinas to join Grant. Lincoln, the ever-prudent leader, listened intently weighing the potential human cost against the urgent need for victory. The meeting was a convergence of minds and wills, where strategies were laid, plans were cemented, and the final push towards ending the war was initiated. This crucial meeting set the stage for some of the final, decisive maneuvers of the American Civil War. Two days later, on March 29th, the Appomattox campaign began, 
marking a turning point in the war. This campaign was a series of battles in Virginia, led by General Ulysses S. Grant. The goal, to cut off Confederate supply lines and bring the Civil War to a swift end. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. On the same day, the engagement at Lewis Farm unfolded. Union Brigadier General Joshua Chamberlain faced off against Confederate Major General Bushrod Johnson. The Union forces numbering about 5,000 clashed with a Confederate force half their size. The battle was fierce with both sides enduring heavy casualties. Yet, the Union forces prevailed, pushing the Confederates back and capturing the strategic Boyden Plank Road. This Union victory chipped away at Confederate morale and resources, further setting the stage for the final act of the war. The engagement at Lewis Farm was a small but significant piece of the larger Appomattox campaign. The final days of March saw a flurry of activity, with a cavalry skirmish at Montevallo, Alabama during Wilson's raid, and battles at White Oak Road and Dinwiddie Courthouse in Virginia. Let's gallop into Montevallo first, where General James H. Wilson led his Union cavalry against the Confederate forces. The skirmish was brief, yet intense. Although outnumbered, Confederates put up a spirited resistance but ultimately couldn't withstand Wilson's force. Casualties were light on both sides, but the skirmish was a strategic victory for the Union, disrupting Confederate communication lines. Meanwhile in Virginia, two significant battles were unfolding. At White Oak Road, General Gouverneur K. Warren's Union forces clashed with the Confederates under General Bushrod Johnson. The battle was fierce, and the Union forces were successful, dealing a critical blow to the Confederates' defense. Simultaneously, at Dinwiddie Courthouse, Union forces under General Philip Sheridan faced off against Confederate troops led by General George Pickett. Despite a hard-fought battle, Pickett's forces were eventually forced to retreat. These skirmishes and battles, large and small, were all leading to a climax, a conclusion to a war that had ravaged the nation for four long years. On a day like no other, April 1, 1865, the Battle of Five Forks took place in Virginia. The stage was set with Union General Philip Sheridan leading one side and Confederate General George Pickett commanding the other. Sheridan boasted an impressive force of nearly 20,000 men, while Pickett countered with a meager force of less than 10,000. The battle raged, and when the dust settled, the Union had suffered around 800 casualties, but the Confederates had lost a staggering 3,000. This Union victory wasn't just another notch on the belt, but a strategic triumph that cut off critical Confederate supply lines. The Confederates, now deprived of essential resources, found their defenses significantly weakened. This was a pivotal moment in the war, a Union victory that weakened the Confederate defense. A day later, on April 2nd, the Confederate government took a drastic step. The heart of the Confederacy, Richmond, was evacuated. The decision wasn't made lightly. The Federals were closing in, and the Confederates saw no other option. They took to the road, their destination the small town of Danville, Virginia. At the same time, the Confederate lines at Petersburg were breached. The storming of Fort Gregg, a Confederate stronghold, marked a turning point. The Federals, under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant, were making significant inroads into Confederate territory. By April 3rd, the Federals had occupied both Richmond and Petersburg. The Confederate capital city, once a symbol of Southern resistance, was now under federal control. The ramifications were profound. This marked a significant shift in the course of the war, and it dealt a major blow to the morale of the Confederate forces and their supporters. The Confederacy was on its heels, its capital city now in federal hands. In a poignant turn of events, President Lincoln visited Richmond on April 4th. The city, still smoldering from the recent evacuation, became the backdrop for Lincoln's unceremonious arrival. He tread on the very ground that had been the heart of the Confederacy, a place where decisions were made that had divided the nation. As he walked the streets, Lincoln was met with varied reactions. Some looked upon him with awe, others with resentment, but all with a sense of curiosity. The president, once an enemy figure, was now walking freely in their city. This wasn't a triumphant parade, but a quiet, introspective journey. Lincoln visited the former Confederate White House, a symbolic gesture that spoke volumes. It's hard to imagine the mix of emotions he must have felt. Relief, sorrow, perhaps even a sense of hope for a unified future. This visit, a symbol of impending unity, marked a significant moment in the war. 
The early days of April 1865 saw one of the last major battles of the American Civil War, the Battle of Sailor's Creek. It was a clash of wills between two seasoned warriors, Union Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant and Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Grant commanded a massive force of about 100,000 men, while Lee held the line with a significantly smaller force of around 30,000. The battle was fierce, and the cost was high. The Union suffered approximately 1,700 casualties, but for the Confederacy, the toll was much higher, with an estimated 7,700 men lost. The Union's victory here was more than just a battle won. It signaled the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. The Battle of Sailor's Creek marked a significant turn in the war, with the Confederacy losing a large chunk of their remaining forces. The very next day, two significant engagements took place in Virginia. At High Bridge, Union troops under the command of General Edward O.C. Ord clashed with Confederate forces led by General James Longstreet. The Confederates, outnumbered and outgunned, fought valiantly but were ultimately pushed back, sustaining heavy casualties in the process. Simultaneously at Cumberland Church, another battle raged. Here, the Union's General Philip Sheridan squared off against Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Despite a brave stand, the Confederate forces found themselves again on the losing side, further depleting their dwindling numbers. These engagements were not isolated incidents, but part of a larger narrative. The Union's relentless push was meeting the Confederacy's desperate attempts to hold their ground. Yet with each engagement, the Confederate forces were further weakened, their hope for victory fading. These engagements further weakened the Confederate forces, setting the stage for the final acts of the war. On April 8th, the siege of Spanish Fort in Alabama concluded while another battle ignited at Appomattox Station. The siege left the Confederacy without a stronghold in Alabama, a heavy blow with considerable casualties. Meanwhile, at Appomattox Station, Union and Confederate forces clashed fiercely. Commanded by stalwarts on both sides, the Union once again emerged victorious. The Confederates had to bear the brunt of the losses. These events further paved the way for the end of the war. On April 9th, a significant event unfolded that many considered to be the end of the war. Confederate General Robert E. Lee, worn down by relentless Union pursuits, surrendered to Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. But while this moment is often seen as the Civil War's final curtain, the reality was more complex. Yes, it marked a decisive turning point, but the path to peace still had hurdles to cross. Lee's surrender to Grant signaled the beginning of the end of the American Civil War, but the journey to peace was far from over. On the 12th of April, 1865, a significant event occurred in the heart of Mobile, Alabama. Union General Edward Canby, a steadfast figure, accepted the surrender from Confederate General Dabney H. Morey. The Confederate forces, strained by dwindling resources and the strategic importance of Mobile, had no choice but to yield. This surrender marked a crucial turning point, a tangible symbol of the Confederacy's collapsing resistance. With Mobile now in Union hands, the tide of war was turning. A day later, on the 13th of April, a skirmish erupted in Raleigh, North Carolina. The Confederate troops led by General Joseph E. Johnston clashed with Union forces under the command of General William T. Sherman. Both sides were equally determined, leading to a fierce encounter. Despite their valiant efforts, the Confederates suffered heavy losses, yet the Union also paid a steep price. This confrontation, though small in scale, had enormous implications, influencing the war's momentum. The skirmish at Raleigh marked another critical moment in the Civil War. On the following day, the 14th of April, a symbolic act took place at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. As the sun rose, the United States flag was hoisted high over the fort, a sign of Union victory. Major General Robert Anderson, the Union officer who had been forced to surrender the fort four years earlier, was given the honor of raising the flag. Across the nation, reactions varied widely, but for the Union, this act was more than symbolic. The raising of the flag over Fort Sumter was a beacon of hope for the Union. The Later that same day, a tragedy struck that would forever mark the 14th of April, President Abraham Lincoln, attending a play at Ford's Theater, was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, a Confederate sympathizer. Booth's motive, he believed he was avenging the South. The news of Lincoln's assassination sent shockwaves throughout the country, adding another layer of complexity to the ongoing war. With Lincoln's death, the nation was plunged into mourning and uncertainty. On the 15th of April, the nation woke up to the grim reality of Lincoln's death. 
A profound shockwave swept both the Union and the Confederacy, and amidst the mourning, Andrew Johnson was sworn in as the new President of the United States. Johnson, a Southern Unionist and former Vice President, inherited a nation in turmoil. His ascension to the presidency stirred a mix of uncertainty and anticipation. With Johnson at the helm, the nation braced for what was to come. On the 16th of April, Union forces made significant gains in Georgia. They stormed into Columbus and West Point, two strategic locations that played pivotal roles in the Confederacy's supply chain. The battles were fierce, and the streets echoed with the cries of soldiers, both Union and Confederate, falling in the line of duty. As news of the Union's victory spread, the public reaction was mixed. Some were jubilant, others mournful. With the capture of Columbus and West Point, the Union tightened its grip on the Confederacy, marking another significant moment in the Civil War. Have you ever wondered about the turning points that led to the end of the American Civil War? Let's cast our minds back to April 18th when Generals William T. Sherman and Joseph Johnston met at Durham Station, North Carolina. This was a pivotal moment as they signed an armistice. An armistice, a formal agreement to stop fighting, was a beacon of hope in a war-weary nation. The significance of this event was monumental as it signaled the beginning of the end of this brutal conflict. This event marked a significant shift in the tide of the war. Just a week later, another pivotal event unfolded. On April 26th, General Joseph Johnston surrendered to General William T. Sherman at Durham Station, North Carolina. The significance of this event was magnified, especially considering Robert E. Lee had already surrendered his army to Ulysses S. Grant. In a war that had been marked by bloodshed and division, these surrenders represented a turning of the tide, a glimmer of peace on the horizon. This surrender was another major step towards the end of the conflict. That very same day, a notorious figure met his end. John Wilkes Booth, the man infamous for assassinating President Lincoln, was cornered in the Garrett Barn at Port Royal, Virginia. A detachment of Union soldiers, led by Boston Corbett, tracked down Booth who refused to surrender. In the ensuing confrontation, Corbett shot Booth, claiming later that it wasn't a deliberate act, but a reaction to Booth raising his weapon. Booth's demise was met with a mix of relief and shock by the public, closing the curtain on a tragic series of events. President Andrew Johnson, who had been thrust into the presidency after Lincoln's assassination, expressed his relief, seeing Booth's death as a necessary closure to a traumatic period. His reaction echoed the sentiments of a nation grappling with the aftermath of a brutal war. Booth's death marked the end of a dark chapter in American history. The very next day, disaster struck. The riverboat Sultana, a sidewheel steamboat, met a catastrophic end. Packed with Union soldiers returning home from Confederate prison camps, the boat was woefully overcrowded. A boiler explosion triggered a chain reaction, causing the boat to catch fire and eventually sink. The exact cause of the explosion remains a mystery, yet some theories suggest sabotage. The death toll was staggering, exceeding 1,000. This tragic event added another layer of complexity to the war's final days. Within a week, the hunt was on for a former Confederate leader. As May dawned, a staggering reward of $100,000 was offered for the capture of Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president. This announcement sent shockwaves across both the North and the South. Davis, however, remained defiant, refusing to succumb to the pressure of the bounty on his head. The hunt for Davis, a symbol of the rebellion, was a clear sign that the war was drawing to a close. In the following weeks, the final engagements of the war played out. On the 4th of May, Confederate General Richard Taylor's forces surrendered at Citronelle, Alabama. This marked another significant blow to the Confederacy, as Taylor was one of its last active generals. His surrender further accelerated the end of the war, creating a sense of inevitability for the remaining Confederate forces. Six days later, on May 10th, the Confederate President Jefferson Davis was captured by United States troops at Irwinville, Georgia. This was a monumental event as Davis was the political figurehead of the Confederacy. His capture symbolized the definitive end of the Confederate government and its aspirations for a separate nation. Then, on the 12th of May, occurred the skirmish at Palmito Ranch in Texas. This engagement is notable as it is widely considered the last battle of the Civil War. 
Despite the Confederate victory, the outcome was inconsequential as the war was effectively over with the surrender of the main Confederate armies and the capture of Jefferson Davis. Finally, on May 26, Confederate General E.K. Smith's trans-Mississippi forces surrendered in New Orleans, Louisiana. This marked the last major Confederate force to lay down arms, signifying the final end of organized resistance. Each of these events brought the nation one step closer to peace. Finally, on June 23, the last Confederate forces surrendered. General Stand Waddy, leading the troops in the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, laid down their arms. This was not just another surrender, it marked the end of an era. It symbolized the final act of defiance by the Confederacy, the last ember of a rebellion extinguished. The significance of Wadi's surrender was profound as it marked the definitive close of the American Civil War. And so, the American Civil War, a conflict that had torn the nation apart, finally came to an end.